This morning we'd like to draw your attention to Hebrews 11 beginning with verse 23. As we have here the hallmark of faith, those who have left their mark because of their faith in God, the author finally comes to Moses. And he said, By faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw that he was a beautiful child. And they were not afraid of the king's commandment. And by faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. We are told in the first verse of this chapter that Faith is the substance of things that we hope for and the evidence of things that we don't see. In other words, there are things that we do see that bear witness of the existence of those things that we don't see. We believe in the things we don't see because of the evidence that we can see. The substance of things hoped for, evidence of things not seen. There are many things that I believe in, though I have never seen. I believe in them because of the evidence that I do see. I have never seen the wind, yet I'm convinced that it does exist, for I have felt it. And I have seen it blowing the autumn leaves. I've seen it blowing the dust and the clouds through the sky. And so I believe that the wind does exist, though I have never seen it. There's sufficient evidence to prove to me that there is a wind. I believe in electricity. Now I have felt it, but I've never seen it. I've never seen an electrical current. I don't know that I would recognize one if I could see it. All of these little ionized matters moving along in a line, and yet I've seen the arc of the electrical current when it was grounded. And so from what I can gather as evidence in what I can feel and that which I do see, I believe that electrical currents do exist. I believe in that. I believe in magnetism. I believe in the attraction of opposite poles. No, I've never seen magnetism. Yet I have seen evidence of it. I've taken a magnet and put it down towards a nail and watched the nail jump and hold on to it. And so from the evidence, I, dedu I deduce that there is what they call magnetic force, though I've never seen the magnetic force. So don't tell me that seeing is believing because we believe in a lot of things that we don't see. Now, I thus believe in the existence of God. I've never seen God, but I have certainly felt God. I have felt his love. I have felt his power. I have felt his presence. I have seen the work of God in the hearts and lives of so many people. And so from that evidence that I can see and that I can feel I believe in the existence of the invisible God that I cannot see for the evidence that is all around me. Now, 
In the 11th chapter here, having declared that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, he gives us a lot of evidence for the existence of God through the work that was wrought in the lives and through the lives of those people who did believe and trust in God. These are the things that they did. These are the things that they accomplished. And it is evidence to cause us to believe in the existence of God and to increase our faith in God. For without faith it's impossible to please God. He that comes to God must believe that he does exist and that he rewards those who diligently seek him. And so we get the example of those who sought God, who believed in God, and we see the evidence of their faith in the things that they wrought for God. As we get to Moses, we find that Moses' faith began early in his life. His whole life was sort of founded upon the faith principle. For when he was born, his mother Jochebed looked at him and he was such a beautiful little fellow. She defied the king's decree that all of the little babies should be thrown, that is the boy babies, born in among the tribes of Israel should be thrown in the Nile River. Now at the time Moses was born, the Hebrews were slaves to the Egyptians. At the time he was born, the Pharaoh felt threatened by the rapid multiplication of the Hebrews, and so he ordered that when a boy was born, the mother was to throw it into the Nile River to drown it. But when Moses was born, his mother looked at him and such a beautiful little baby, she decided to defy the king's order and she hid him for three months. But when it got to where she could not hide him anymore, then she obeyed the king's order because she found a loophole in the law. He said they're to be put in the Nile River. Well, she made a little basket and put pitch around it, made it waterproof, and then she put him in the basket in the Nile River. And as he was floating there in his waterbed, <laughs> the queen came down to bathe, or the, the uh, pharaoh's daughter came down to bathe in the river. Someone said at that moment the angel pinched Moses and he began to cry. And she hearing the cry of a baby, they discerned that the cry was coming from that little basket out in the water and she sent one of her maidens to fetch the basket. And when she looked in, she saw this beautiful little baby boy. Fell in love with it immediately and she said, I'm going to keep this child for myself. It's evidently one of the Hebrews' children. Moses had an older sister who was sort of hiding in the bushes to see what would happen to her little brother. And when she saw the interest that the Pharaoh's daughter had, she ran up to her and she said, Would you like me to get one of the Hebrew ladies to nurse your child for you? And the Pharaoh's daughter said, Oh, would you be so kind? I'll be glad to pay them wages for doing it. And Miriam ran home as fast as she could and said, Mom, I've got a job for you. <laughs> Taking care of Moses and the Pharaoh's daughter is going to pay you for it. You can be sure that as Moses was growing up, his mother rehearsed to him the story of God's faithfulness, the story of God's preservation, the story of God's deliverance. And faith in God was planted deep in the heart of that child. 
Now by faith, when Moses came of years. We know from the story that at this point he was 40 years old. So it wasn't the impulsive decision of a teenager. But it was the well thought out matured decision of age. Moses, when he had come of age, made important choices, for he refused to be called the son of the Pharaoh's daughter. As the son of the Pharaoh's daughter, he could have enjoyed the luxuries of the palace in Egypt. He could have enjoyed all of the honor and the glory of a ruling family in Egypt, possibly in the future even becoming the pharaoh of Egypt. As a member of the royal family, he would have had a life of ease and comfort, a life of wealth, opulence, and he could have indulged himself totally in the lust of his flesh. But he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, but chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God. As identifying with the people of God who were slaves, he was, to offer, he was to also suffer the reproach that the Egyptians had for the Hebrews. Now why would a man make such a choice? Choose to give up the wealth and the luxury of Egypt to suffer affliction with God's people. Choose to walk after God and after the Spirit rather than after the flesh. There were three reasons why he made the choice. The first is that he realized that the pleasures of sin were just for a season, they're not lasting. It's amazing how quickly the excitement or thrill of sin wears off. A moment of folly can lead to a lifetime of regret. A lifetime of folly can lead to an eternity of regret. And so realizing that the pleasures of sin could not last there only for a season, he wanted something that was more lasting. The second reason why he made the choice is that he had a respect of the recompense of reward. That is, he looked down the road to the long-term effect. A lifetime of sin was to be rewarded with an eternity apart from God. A lifetime of righteousness was to be rewarded with an eternity with God in the glory of God's eternal kingdom. He chose the eternal kingdom over the temporal kingdom. He knew that it would profit him nothing to have all of the riches of Egypt if it meant that he would lose his own soul. And so because he considered the eternal aspects, he chose rather 
to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the riches of Egypt. One of our problems in making choices is that we always do not look at the long-term effect of that choice. You see, so often when we are faced with a choice, what we look at is the immediate benefits. And I am prone, if there are immediate benefits, to go ahead and make that choice and then take my chances with the future. And it seems that the proverb, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, is something that many people sort of live by. If it can bring to me a momentary temporal advantage, I'll go for it. But I don't always analyze what will be the consequences down the road. After I get down the road a ways, then what will be the consequence of that choice? Now, Moses had enough wisdom to look down the road and see what the long-term effect of the choice would be and thus chose wisely. The third reason for making the wise choice is that he considered God in the Factor, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. And because he took God into the equation, it made all of the difference in the world as far as where the balance comes out. And it's so important that in our decisions of life that we always include God in the equation because the results can be so different when we exclude God or when we include Him. Moses endured the affliction with God's people. He suffered Affliction because of his choice. He suffered reproach because of his choice. And yet he endured these things. So many times as we look at another person's life and we see the things that they are going through, we see the trials, we see the problems that we face, we stand back in admiration wondering, how in the world can they endure those things? And as we attempt to put ourselves in their shoes, we wonder if we would be able to endure as they have endured. If I could respond as they are responding, if I could maintain my faith and my confidence in God, if I were going through those things that they are going through. The secret to that enduring quality, being able to suffer the afflictions, being able to take the reproach, the secret of it is being able by faith to see God and to see God's hand in my life. Remember that faith accepts the evidence for the things that you cannot see. And I believe in God. To me it is very evident that he does exist. And I accept what I can see of the work of God as validity for my faith in God. But I also believe that God loves me supremely. This was evidenced when Jesus suffered for me and died for my sins. 
And so I believe in God's love for me. And I also believe that God is in control of my life and those things that surround my life because I have turned my life over to Him and committed my future to Him. And so I believe that God then controls everything that happens to me. I don't believe in accidents. I believe that God has a purpose and a reason for everything that takes place in my life. Because I have turned my life over to Him. Now, the problem is that as God is working in my life and bringing the various circumstances into my life, God is always working from the eternal time frame. He is working for my eternal good. He is interested in my eternal welfare and the eternal benefits. God always has eternity in view. I, being human, have time in view. The temporal is always in my view. Many times, as God is working out the eternal plan, it is of a temporary problem to me. He's working by the eternal. I'm interested in the temporal and thus I am many times mentally in conflict with the things that are happening in my life. And I am prone at times to say, but God, why? Why would you allow this? Why would I have to suffer affliction? Why do I have to bear the reproach? And it is because of my nearsightedness, my interest in my temporal welfare. And yet God, as He works, is working out for my eternal welfare. My life has not and is not a bed of roses. It's more like a rose bed. I've got the thorns in my life, not just petals. God didn't promise us an immunity from suffering, from problems, from difficulties. God did promise that he would keep us, that he would strengthen us, that he would help us. And he did promise that all things that do happen are happening for good because we love God and are called according to his purpose. So I may not see the eternal plan of God. That's not important. I can endure as long as I know that God is in it. You see, that corrects my perspective. When I can see the eternal and I can see the temporal, then I'm all right. When something that I had received so much enjoyment from and all suddenly is gone, I realize that the things of life are only temporal. They're all going to burn. And I begin to put my values in the eternal things. He endured as seeing him who is invisible. Oh, how important that we can see the hand of God and the work of God by his spirit. Makes all the difference in how I view a situation. One time the prophet Elisha was sleeping soundly in the morning his servant Gehazi went out to chop some wood to make the fire. And he looked up, and on the hills surrounding the city of Dothan, Ben Hadad, the king of Samaria, had, or, I mean, the king of uh, Syria, had moved in his troops, his tanks, 
surrounded the city. They were chariots in those days. Gehazi went running in and woke up Elisha, and he said, Alas, master, we've had it. The Syrian army surrounded us. There's no escape. There's no way out. The prophet rolled over in bed, offered up a sleepy prayer. Oh, God, open up this fellow's eyes that he can see what's really happening. And the prophet continued to sleep as Gehazi went back outside. But now his eyes to the spirit were open and he saw the angels of the Lord completely surrounding the Syrian army. What a different perspective. It's no longer, alas, we've had it, we're surrounded. It's alas, they've had it, they're surrounded. So many times when we look at a situation, we're looking at it from just the pure temporal vantage that we have. And we're prone to despair, to be dismayed, and to give up. But the secret being able to see the hand of God in these things and to know that God rules and God is in control. We must look beyond the immediate to the eternal. Now, Moses had quite a choice to make. The choice was whether or not to align himself with God's people and suffer afflictions with them or align himself with Pharaoh's daughter and enjoy the pleasures of sin. The choice was whether or not to suffer the reproach of God's people or to enjoy the riches of Egypt. Now we have similar choices, but probably not to such a degree. For in reality, the people of God do not suffer that much affliction today. We're not a race of slaves, except perhaps if you were in Russia. or some of the communist-controlled countries. But here, Christianity is almost a respectable thing. And so, we don't bear that much reproach. We don't suffer that much affliction. And on the other side of the coin, we don't have the opportunity of having all of the treasures of Egypt or to be identified in the family of the ruling power. So the choice that Moses made was really much greater than the choice that we make. But choose we must. For we must choose whether or not we are going to live after our flesh or we're going to live after the Spirit. We must choose whether or not we're going to walk with God in a path of righteousness or walk in our own flesh the path that we choose. power of choice is probably one of the greatest blessings God has bestowed upon us, and yet it is also one of the most awesome responsibilities that any of us have. Because in choosing the path, we are also choosing our destiny. 
And that is why, is it, why it is always wise to take eternity into view when I am making my choice, as did Moses. Taking eternity into view, he made the right choices. If I don't, I'm apt to make the wrong choices. I'm apt to opt for the momentary advantage rather than the eternal benefit. Choice, ours to make, but remember, the choice that you make is not for just now. There are eternal implications. So we pray. Father, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for sending your Son that we might have this power of choice. And Lord, we do choose this day to serve you, to live for you, to commit our lives, Lord, into your care, to identify ourselves, Father, with the people of God. Rejecting, Lord, this cursed world around us. We would live in the Spirit, after the Spirit, doing the things of the Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Elisha faced the children of Israel at a time of national peril spiritual degeneration and he said choose this day whom you will serve if Jehovah is God then serve him but if Baal is God then serve him but you've got to make your choice many of them had chosen to worship and to serve Baal at that time the flesh, the God of the flesh. Even as many of you have been serving the God of your flesh. Now, to choose to live after the flesh, though it may bring pleasure, it is not lasting. You will soon become jaded And with it, frustrated and ultimately cynical. But in serving God, you begin to experience the blessings of His eternal riches. If we could somehow call Moses today, you see, it was about 3,700 years ago he made this choice. He's been living with the effects of that choice for 3,700 years. He appeared on the mount with Jesus when Jesus was transfigured, so he's still around. Talking to Jesus then about the glories of the kingdom. If we could say, Moses, hey, 3,700 years ago, you made a very important choice. You turned down an awful lot, man. Treasures of Egypt, pleasures of sin in the palace, and total indulgence. And, and you chose to suffer affliction with God's people. The reproach of God's people. Moses, tell us now. Do you think you made the right choice? And what do you suppose his response would be? No doubt about it. For the light affliction, which was but for a moment, worked an exceeding eternal weight of glory. You bet I made the right choice. 
hey, if 3,700 years from now we could ask you about the choices that you have made. If you have chosen to live after the flesh, I know what your response would be. 3,700 years from now, I know how you would respond. Also, if you choose to live for God, I also know what your response would be. But remember, that's actually what you're choosing. Your eternal destiny lies in the capacity of your choice. Maybe this morning you'd like to make your choice to follow Jesus Christ. I'd encourage you to go back to the prayer room. The pastors will be back there to pray with you. May the Lord be with you now and bless you, give you wisdom, guidance, health, and strength as you walk with him in Jesus' name.